All right, as soon as you guys get logged in, those of you guys who are live streaming, just give me a shout. I've got my chat feed up here, and I want to see that you guys are able to see me and hear me. And then we're going to start talking about why you should treat day trading like a business. Uh, this is going to be uh, sort of a, uh, an intro to treating trading uh, or looking at trading um, through the lens of someone who's a profitable trader and uh, trying to adopt that mindset because success in trading is more than just skill and, and strategy. Not that those aren't very important because they are, but it's also about the mindset. It's about how you approach trading, how you think about trading, how you handle the ups and downs of trading. And by thinking about it, from the perspective of this is a business that I'm starting, uh, essentially. It's not any different than starting a business, opening a coffee shop or, you know, a, um, a car dealership or automotive repair shop or whatever the case is. Um, that helps in a lot of ways for you to uh, be able to handle those losses a little bit better, to become less uh, attached to them, to actually detach from them from an emotional perspective. And that puts you in the mindset, uh, which is much more similar to those who are really, really successful. I think one of the hard things about getting started is that many of us don't know a lot of profitable traders. Uh, we may not even know anyone uh, at all that's a trader. And so we're in this place of trying to kind of just figure it out. Whereas if you were going to open a coffee shop or something like that, there are certainly lots of coffee shops out there that you can kind of base your business on and when you're uh, starting the process of evaluating whether or not this is going to work you would just naturally refer to okay what are the things you need to do before you start a small business you need a business plan you might need a loan you might need to invest in um, equipment or infrastructure or you know rent and all that stuff but when people approach day trading most people approach it in this very kind of nonchalant way of Oh, I'm just gonna, you know, open up my app on my phone and, you know, jump into Robinhood or Webull or whatever. And I'm just gonna take a couple trades and see if I can make a little money. And then, of course, they get further into it, but they start it from this very kind of um, haphazard uh, uh, spot, which ultimately, uh, because that's the way so many people start their career, it starts them off on a bad note. You can't really like haphazardly or you know in a nonchalant way start a coffee shop. You know, any anything on that level takes a lot of planning. Which ultimately, the more you plan, you know, the the more likely you are to succeed. It's um, measure twice, cut once, and for every I don't know what they say. For every hour of planning, you save yourself uh, a day of, of time. There's some ratio that people talk about, especially on development projects like tech projects. And so when we were building our, um, our new day trading chat room at Warrior, we spent a lot of time planning it and a lot of time testing different things. Uh, and, and we did have a couple of sort of false starts on it, but uh, we learned that the, the more you plan, then when you actually sit down and, and start um, getting into it, it just makes it a lot faster. But that's not how most people uh, approach trading. So uh, I see you guys getting logged in here on uh, Facebook and YouTube. We've got about 500 live streaming on uh, YouTube right now and about 180 on Facebook. So thank you guys. Typically when I go live on um, a weekday, this is a Saturday, when I go live on a weekday right around 9 a.m., Everyone knows that that's when I stream. And so I'll, on YouTube, I uh, recently have five, 6,000, even 7,000 people live streaming, which is amazing. Uh, but when I jump on here at a random time, which is 1.30 on a Saturday, uh, I just catch those of you guys who are hanging out or on your uh, phone or on your computer or what have you. So thank you guys who are live. I will um, answer some questions from those who are live. But for those that are watching this as a video on, on YouTube or re-watching the, the live stream on Facebook, you guys can feel free to put comments down below and um, I am hoping that the content of this Facebook and YouTube live is timeless in the sense that what I'm going to talk about is relevant. Uh, it was relevant three years ago, it'll be relevant three years from now. So 
regardless of when you might be watching this, I, I think you'll probably uh, still enjoy it. So uh, thank you guys for, for tuning in here today. And it looks like I've got a pretty good Wi-Fi signal, uh, which is also really nice because sometimes when I'm outside, I, uh, I, my Wi-Fi gets a little shaky. So uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, during this uh, live stream as well are the metrics of a profitable trader. And so uh, as a sort of comparison, um, at one point I was looking at, um, I was looking at buying uh, a rental property, uh, you know, like a, um, a building where I would have commercial tenants and everything like that. And so I, as part of that process, did some research about what are, what are, the, what are good profit margins uh, and what's a, what's a typical profit loss statement look like for a rental property to get a sense of, you know, basically, does the cost of this property and the current rental rates um, justify this being a good investment or is it not a good investment? And so, you know, through that process, I found that there was a lot of information out there about the ratio of the value of the property, your monthly rent, and then uh, the value of the property versus what you ex should expect in overhead from property tax to insurance to maintenance, upkeep, and property management, and so on and so forth. So there's a, a pretty there's a pretty good set of data around what makes a, a really good rental property. All right, and so if you're thinking about getting into it, it of course makes sense for you to research that, become educated on on those those metrics, and then when you're looking at a property, you can kind of fill in that that sheet. Okay, so this property, let's just say, is five hundred thousand dollars. Okay, that's good. Uh, the monthly income from rent right now is five thousand dollars a month. Okay, so that means over the whole year it brings in sixty thousand bucks. Now that's actually really good uh, from the perspective of that's ten percent return each year, but that's before costs. You factor in, okay, what's the property tax on this building? It's fifteen thousand a year. What's the insurance? It's another fifteen thousand. All right, so now you've gone from sixty thousand in profit down to thirty thousand in profit. All right, and then you know you've got to save some money for upkeep. You've got plowing, and you've got um, you know utility infrastructure, boilers, AC units, things like that. And now the upkeep of those, you're coming down to maybe netting only twenty thousand, which is um, on a five hundred thousand dollar investment. You know you're you're looking at a return of about four percent a year. So that same four percent, you know there might be easier ways to make four percent. Now, what's the appreciation of the, of the property in that area? And, th and that's when you can start to kind of um, say, all right, well, this might work if I could get the property for 400 grand. Uh, or if I could uh, increase the, the rent for the, the tenants and if they're commercial tenants and stuff like that. And so, you know, these are the numbers that you play around with. And, and we do essentially the exact same thing when it comes to trading. So let's talk before we get into uh, the metrics portion, let's talk for a moment about treating day trading as if it is a small business. All right, so many of you guys know uh, I'm, I'm hosting summer school uh, this summer for the first time ever. We're right now, for those watching this months from now or years from now, whatever, um, we're still dealing with COVID-19 uh, and the market, as many of us know, dropped 35%, is now coming back up off the low. In fact, the market's only down about 10% now off the high, which is um, good for those of us that have long-term investments, 401ks, etc. cetera. Um, but because a lot of things are still closed and a lot of people are, unemployment is still very, very high right now, uh, there are a lot of folks that are uh, not going to be hitting the beach this summer. They're not going to be traveling this summer, including me. And so I decided to host the summer school program. So uh, during summer school, we're going to talk quite a bit about setting up, about approaching this as, um, as a, approaching day trading as <coughs> a business. Okay, so the first, uh, the first kind of layer, the first step, I would say, is the discovery or the realization that this is actually a viable business opportunity, right? So, for instance, um, running a coffee shop. Owning and running a coffee shop 
is a viable business. There are other people that do it. Uh, there are coffee shops all around the world, obviously. And so day trading, similarly, is a viable business. Now, the average success rate of a coffee shop, it's hard to say. I don't know. The average success rate of a day trader, also sort of hard to say because we don't have a lot of that data. Most of that data would have to come from uh, brokers. They would have to release that data about active traders. And although there have been a few studies that, that have gotten into that data, uh, they've, been, they've been really small uh, sets of data, uh, uh, so that, that they're not really super conclusive about a population or a, um, a large amount of people. But in any case, we know that day trading uh, is a career that, that many people embark on and uh, certainly can be profitable. Okay, so first step is discovery. Now, those of you guys live streaming, I've seen now 720. Um, I would like to see half of you hit that thumbs up button. I'd like to see 360 thumbs up um, for this live stream. A little Saturday school for those of you guys tuning in. Uh, now, you may know this already, but I don't monetize my YouTube channel. I don't run any ads on YouTube. But uh, what I ask you guys to do is to give me the, those thumbs up and definitely subscribe to the channel if you haven't already because that tells YouTube that this is the place to be if you want to learn about day trading. All right, so thank you guys uh, for doing that. And, and same with, with Facebook. All right, so first step of learning to trade or first step of this business uh, is discovering that it's a possibility. And so share with a friend that, you know, is maybe uh, might be someone that's interested in this. Now, the second step is beginning to do a little bit of due diligence, beginning to do a little bit of research and kind of understand uh, how does this work. And, and one of the best ways to do that, in the example of a coffee shop, is to look at a coffee shop. Okay, so, you know, let's, let's just, let's take two coffee shops, for instance. Let's take Starbucks, which is an uh, international chain, right? And let's take uh, Mocha Joe's, which is a coffee shop in uh, Brattleboro, Vermont, although it's also a coffee shop in LA um, on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Larry David, of course, opened uh, Larry's uh, Latte Larry's uh, right next door, the Spite store. Uh, <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, Mocha Joe's in Brattleboro is a one, one shop coffee shop. They have a coffee roaster and it's a one shop shop. So coffee sh that coffee shop has been there for maybe 30 years, maybe longer. So they're clearly very successful. So what is it about, um, and, and so here's the question, is, am I aspiring to be uh, Starbucks or am I aspiring to run something like Mocha Joe's? Now, as it relates to trading, I would say this is kind of like uh, looking at Goldman Sachs traders or a average trader just trading his or her own money and doing it on their own. Okay, so I'm like the Mocha Joes. I'm, I'm trading my own money. I'm trading, um, I, I don't work for a big hedge fund. I don't work at a big bank. I, I'm doing this for myself. So it's important when you're trying to get a sense of how this would work for you that you're using a more realistic um, uh, example is what you're trying to measure against. So I'm not gonna try to measure the coffee shop against Starbucks because that's, I'm never gonna own 25,000 coffee shops all around the world. I, I really just want to have one. All right, so you know, what is it that has made Mocha Joe's uh, so successful? What is it that's allowed them to be in business for as long as they have? Well, uh, probably a couple things. One, great location. Two, great coffee. Uh, three, reasonable prices. And um, four, uh, a really nice atmosphere where you can go and you can sit down, you can get a cup of coffee, and then you can just hang out and play chess with some friends for like six hours. And when I was growing up in my teens, kids, you know, uh, adolescent teenagers, we would, you know, go down to Mocha Joe's and uh, hang out downtown. And it could be a snowy day outside, but you could hang out in the coffee shop with some friends. Uh, and I could walk from my house down, down, downtown in Brattleboro. So, you know, it was a cool place to kind of hang out. You do that when you're young and a teenager, and then, you know, you're doing it in your late teens and early 20s, and then you see some of the folks that have been in the coffee shop for 25 years, and they're in their 30s or 40s, and they're still there. Okay, so if you were going to try to model a coffee shop um, in your town, you would probably be thinking about um, similar types of things, location, quality, uh, atmosphere, price, etc. And then, of course, you would 
after you've kind of scoped that out, you would actually have to look at the, uh, the sort of profit loss statement, the balance sheet. What, what's the infrastructure to get started? But let's hold on that for a second. So from the day trading side, uh, I want to show you guys um, uh, some of my metrics here. So I'm going to do, um, let's see, I'm going to actually go like this. Oops, sorry, like this. All right. Uh, I've got a couple different um, kind of layouts here. So this uh, right here, th these are my metrics um, from 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and now where I'm at right now in 2020, and it's May 30th. So I've, I've made almost the same as what I made all of last year, and I still have June, July, August, September, October, November, December. I still have seven months left. So you know that I'm, I've got my eyes set on breaking my 2018 uh, record. All right, now this is, this is gross profit. Uh, so you know, looking at the gross profit of a coffee shop is, um, is, is one thing, but of course there's overhead. So what I wanna show you here are the metrics of a profitable trader uh, who is uh, essentially a, a retail trader trading his own money, which is that's exactly what I'm doing. I uh, trade both in a retirement account and in a uh, traditional margin account. Now, one of the things that, well, I'll talk about taxes in a second. Um, and this isn't probably going to be like a super short YouTube live. I want to, you know, give you guys, this is going to be like a nice class. So remind me if I don't get, if I, if I seem like I've forgotten, uh, let's come back to taxes. Uh, but let's kind of look at the metrics here. So, so what this is uh, sort of on the surface is the this is the proof that I am a profitable trader and that I have a strategy that works. So that's kind of like okay, this is a coffee shop that's been around for a while. So now let's look a little deeper at it. Now, I uh, I, I take an approach with trading which is uh, probably not different from other businesses or, um, or potential careers, which is that I, I have a niche. I have a, a area of the market where I focus pretty exclusively. For instance, you could have people that trade Forex. You could have people, and you know, of course we do. You could have people that trade futures. You could have people that trade cryptocurrency and you people that invest long-term. And then you have people that day trade stocks and the people that day trade stocks some day trade the s p 500 some trade options some day trade large caps like tesla apple netflix google some day trade penny stocks that are 10 cents and 15 cents and what i focus on is day trading stocks generally between one and, and ten dollars so what i'm going to kind of do here um just to kind of keep keep us on on track um We've got, uh, we've got, obviously, we're not going to talk about the Goldman Sachs traders and the big institutional traders that are out there. Those are the ones that are buying um, huge positions of large cap companies. They're not trading their own money. They're, of course, therefore very detached from profits and, and losses because it doesn't really, you know, obviously it affects their bonuses, but it's not their money. So we're going to keep focused on me being a, a retail trader trading my own money. When I got started in this um, small business, essentially, of, of being a day trader, what I was looking for, essentially, was um, I was I was starting my own uh, self-employment agency. And so what I mean by that is this is a business where I do have to come in to work every day. I have to trade the market. I can't, the business of being a day trader, it's not a business that you could sell because you're of course, such a critical part of the profitability. So really what you've created is a, um, a stream of income that you still have to work for. And so it, we, I would, so it's kind of like being self-employed. Uh, and that's not from a tax perspective, but just from a sort of mental perspective. The problem, though, is that when you put your own money on the line, you know, you put $10,000 on the line into the market, to start trading, as um, many of you may have done. What frequently happens uh, as a beginner trader is that you will experience losses. And of course, you take those very personally, and you feel like a failure. You feel like you're a loser. You feel like you're an idiot. 
And you think about the, the traders out there that are driving the Maseratis or the Aston Martin, and they're incredibly successful. They probably work at Goldman Sachs, and they're getting you know, $30, $40 million bonuses and stuff like that. And that would be the Mocha Joes comparing himself to Starbucks and being like, man, I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to get there. And so what I realized was that uh, for a long time in, in my career as I was getting started, I was, uh, I was thinking about what those big traders were doing. I was thinking about what people like Carl Icahn, Warren Buffett, and Bill Ackman were doing. But the fact is, uh, both their mentality and the way they approached the market and, and the fact that um, uh, in, in, in many of those instances, um, they're trading uh, other people's money and they're running trading as a, uh, a large institution or a hedge fund makes it almost incomparable to what, to what I was doing. Not only could they take positions and hold losses, they could also do complex things like um, you know, use options to hedge their trades or petition the board to sell the company so they could make money. I mean, it's, they have such a different uh, place in the market. And so when I was trading stocks like Apple, uh, and I was buying options, getting in and out, trying to day trade them. You know, I was thinking there's obviously traders out there that are doing this, but many of those traders would have been working at um, large, large funds, not uh, trading their own money or small retail traders. So it took me um, a period of time of experiencing a number of losses before I was able to uh, make the realization that as, um, you know, the Mocha Joe retail trader, I needed to find my niche in the market, and it actually was going to be very different from what um, a lot of the, the big uh, hedge funds and, and institutional traders are focusing on. And so, as many of you guys uh, may be in the same situation, I have a small account. So, give me a shout of what size account you're currently trading with or planning on trading with. And those of you guys, looks like we've got about almost a thousand live streaming on YouTube. So. Um, I would love it if you guys who just got uh, tuned in would give us the thumbs up here for a little Saturday school. So Jonathan says he's trading with a thousand bucks. Baker says a thousand. Richard says five hundred. Ron says thirty-eight thousand. Someone else says six hundred fifty thousand. Uh, Pajin said uh, ten thousand, six thousand for CJ, uh, twelve thousand for Russell, five thousand for Quinton, uh, seventeen hundred, twenty-five hundred for Omar. So. Uh, you know, certainly we're seeing a little bit of a range. Um, 25000 for Fred, 13000 for Mark over on Facebook. Um, we've got Brody, he's paper trading. Edwin's got 32000 So, uh, So actually, some of you guys have fairly large accounts. But uh, when I was getting started, I was trading in a smaller account. And this is kind of the problem when you have a small account. You trade a stock like Facebook. And on an average day, Facebook might only go up 2%. So, you know, let's say you've got a $10,000 account. And let's say you put the entire account into Facebook at the very bottom of low of day, and you get out at the very top and you capture that full 2%. How much is 2% on a $10,000 account? It's 200 bucks. But you're never going to capture the entire move. At best, at best, you, you might capture a quarter of the move or maybe a third of the move. Even capturing half is difficult. So let's say you captured a quarter of the move. You made 50 bucks. Now, as a retail trader, we do have the advantage of trading, if we want to, with leverage. So if you took that trade, that $10,000, and you used four times leverage, you could have bought $40,000 worth of Facebook in this scenario. And if you got that you know, quarter of a percent or quarter of the 2% move, you'd be able to book about $200 in profit. But to get to the point where you're that dialed in on an institutionally traded stock like Facebook, Apple, or Netflix, uh, it's, 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 I, I can't remember a whole lot more frustrating than trying to get a really good feel for a large cap stock that will suddenly, uh, for seemingly no reason, flush down and tank uh, in the middle of the day. Why would that happen? A couple of institutional traders at one of the big firms hits the sell button and dumps a, a large position. Or all of a sudden, you know, it, it spikes up unexpectedly. 
What happened? Well, some institutional trader, some hedge fund, some pension fund, whatever it is, decide to take a position, all of a sudden it pops up. And so those stocks um, on average days are very difficult to trade. They don't respect uh, the traditional patterns. And it's not because, it's partially because of algorithmic trading. Um, but to a much larger extent, uh, it's from uh, just so many active institutional traders getting in and out. So I realized that trading those types of stocks uh, that I was kind of spinning my wheels. I wasn't making a lot of progress. And so to find my niche, I poured through all of my trading data. And what I discovered was that the stocks I was making the most money on were actually uh, lower price stocks that were making big percentage moves. So when you have a stock, and we had one this week that went from $8 to 12 to 13 to 14 to 15 to 17 to 18 to 22 dollars in one day up over 300 percent now that's phenomenal that's probably not a stock that a lot of uh traders or investors at um you know the big hedge funds or, or um, pension funds are going to be actively day trading they're not going to buy a stock that's up 300 percent if they're already holding it maybe they'll sell it but that's not the type of risk profile that that they're usually going to take because you know Many of them are probably trading average position sizes of millions of dollars. And you can't take millions of dollars of stock on an $8 stock. It's just not really feasible in most cases. And so what I found was that those types of stocks are really popular among retail traders like us. Retail traders look for stocks that are making big percentage moves. Because when you have a small account, whether it's $1,000, it's $10,000, or maybe it's even $100,000, if you can capture 25%, a quarter, of a stock that has just gone up 100%, that's a 25% move. Now, if it goes up 400%, you could potentially be capturing a 100% move. Buying a stock at $8, selling it at 16 and it still goes up to a high of 22 23 24 So those were the type of stocks that I really focus on. So let's jump back uh, and talk a little bit about the metrics here of a, a profitable trader. So you can see my metrics right here. This is where we're going to kind of get into um, like, sort of like the balance sheet, uh, sort of like what I was talking about with um, a, a real estate property. So my niche is focusing on um, lower price stocks. So let's go to detailed and we'll go to uh, price and volume. So you can see here that the majority, and this is over $2 million in gross profit. So this is a, a fairly decent amount of profit here and a, a pretty good data set. So you can see here that the bulk of my profit is actually on stocks between two and five dollars. I've uh, made a decent amount up to 10 and a decent amount up to 20, but above $20, the profits decrease significantly. And below $2, the profits also taper off a little bit. So I think that this is helpful um, in terms of if you're thinking about getting started trading, you naturally, you want to align yourself with the type of trader that you're more likely to become. If you're thinking about opening a coffee shop, you want to look at coffee shops that are more like the type that you think you're going to open. If you're going to start a, um, want to buy a rental property, you need to look at the financials of a rental property that is similar to what you're looking at. And then you start plugging in the numbers. So, uh, this, these right here are the high-level metrics. Uh, you can hear June in the background. So these are the high-level metrics, um, which, uh, which is helpful, but I don't want to get uh, too deep in, in the weeds on this um, just yet. Hey, girl, come on. Come on, girl. She's, she's lost it. Um, so why don't we... Um, why don't we for a second step off, step back off the metrics um, and let's talk a little bit about the uh, kind of infrastructure, uh, startup costs and things like that for, for becoming a trader. God dang, hang on, hold, hold, please hold. <clears throat> hey girl, hey. All right, thank you. Sounds good. Come on, girl. She's killing me. Um, girl, come on. Let's see. 
Um, I'm just gonna put my computer here. Girl, you wanna talk to the camera girl? Yeah. Okay. My apologies. I uh, apologize on behalf of what is uh, essentially a junkyard dog girl. All right. So, uh, once you've kind of figured out, you know, what style of trading you want to focus on um, and you've found a trader, whether it's me or anyone else, um, that you want to kind of use as your, uh, as your template. Okay, I want to model um, my strategy and, and, you know, my approach on what this guy's doing, which, which there's nothing wrong with. Um, you know, you, you think Mocha Joe's is an awesome coffee shop? You can go open a coffee shop just like it. You know, in your own town, Mocha Joe's, I mean, I can't imagine that they're they're going to care. Obviously, you can't name it the same thing, but, uh, you know, many of these coffee shops are all very similar. Oh, this worked really well for this one? Okay, I'm, uh, you know, you see it, uh, that type of coffee shop is popular. I'm going to model mine after it. I'm going to take some tips from them. So, nothing wrong with that. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, this is, I think, this, this, what's going on right now, these distractions is like, is, is just so typical of um, this kind of COVID-19 period that many of us are in, which is like working from home under total, very unusual kind of circumstances. Um, anyways, so, uh, all right, so, so you've got, uh, so you know you want to model your strategy somewhat after me. Okay. So in terms of the business plan and approaching this like it's a business. All right, so you've got, uh, you've got a description of the business. I wanna be a day trader and I wanna you know, I, I trade my own money. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna go work for a big bank. I don't want a nine to five job like that. Even if you know, maybe there's opportunity there, you know, a, an entry level job even at a, a bank or a hedge fund might not necessarily be too, super glamorous. So, you know, you've got your, um, you want to be a retail trader. You've got the sort of description of that business. You're thinking, okay, I want to focus on trading, you know, small cap stocks, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So now what is the, what's sort of the business plan that you put together? So one of the things that, um, that I really encourage is uh, essentially building out a business plan for, uh, for day trading and that business plan should definitely include uh your your cost of equipment to get started which ultimately um you know is a laptop and maybe one or two external usb mo usb or hdmi monitors unlike opening a coffee shop or any type of brick and mortar business uh, brick and mortar business you can get started with very limited financial resources a computer, a couple monitors, uh, obviously an internet connection. Uh, so you need an internet service that you subscribe to. Uh, and then you need a trading platform that you'll use. Now, all brokers offer uh, trading platforms as part of their um, as part of their service. But sometimes they make you pay for it. It could be anywhere from $50 to $100 a month. So you've got some monthly overheads, you know, just starting. And then essentially you have um, the cost of, of education. And there's two different ways to approach this. Obviously I'm biased because not only am I a trader, but I'm also a teacher. Uh, so I'll go the non-biased route first, which is you can teach yourself how to trade. And so the process of doing that essentially is through trial and error, just getting into a trading account, preferably a simulator, so you're not risking real money while you're doing trial and error, and, and practicing and seeing what works. Now, I can tell you from my own experience that I did that for almost two years before I actually started to make profit on a regular basis. I would make money and then I would give it back. And I'd make money, I'd give it back because I didn't have a, a strategy. I didn't have a system. I didn't have a set of rules. So, you know, two years um, of running a small business and having zero profit to show for it and incurring your operating costs the whole time, 
that's a that's a little bit of a, a scary thought. And so the alternative, and this is obviously biased because I am a teacher and I, we're hosting summer school starting on Monday, is to join a program and to actually go through a curriculum. And so, you know, if you think of wanting to start a small business as a, um, you know, a coffee shop owner, a coffee roaster, perhaps there's workshops that you could take um, that teach you how to roast coffee. Obviously, you can get on-the-job training if you go work at a coffee shop. Um, that may be appealing, and maybe you already have done that, and so you want to take it to the next level and learn about roasting coffee. You maybe want to take a um, how to start a small business class at a, it could even be a community college, just to learn some of the basics of accounting and, um, you know, the, the finances and all that stuff. So from a trading uh, perspective, going through um, a program like what we have, what it's essentially going to do for you is give you all of that prerequisite information that you need. It's going to teach you all of the terminology around trading. It's going to teach you the ins and outs of all the different trading platforms. It's going to teach you the ins and outs of how to read and do technical analysis, reading charts, reading level two. And it's actually going to provide you with the strategies that I use every single day. So you walk away from the class with a set of strategies. Now, it, it's obviously not a guarantee that you know how uh, to use them because you have to practice what you are learning, but we help prepare you to do that by giving you access to a trading simulator. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the process if you go through our program. So then as you come back to the business plan, as you are putting it together, you punch in, what is my strategy? How am I going to trade the market? And so you might say, okay, I'm going to be trading the uh, same strategy that Ross trades. I'm going to trade uh, stocks between $2 and $10, right? So back to um, over here. I'm going to trade stocks between $2 and $10. Generally speaking, I will, um, uh, and we could just go from like, uh, you know, this month, for instance. Uh, so this is the month of, of May. So uh, $2 to $20, maybe that, that's an acceptable uh, range. I will focus on trading primarily between what times? 9 a.m., 9.30 when the bell rings, and 10.30, 11 a.m. Okay, so you've got the price of stock you're going to trade. You've got the time of day you're going to trade. And then uh, the day of week, I'm going to trade every day. Fine, okay, that's, that's typical. Most of us do trade every day. How long am I going to hold my trades? I'm not going to hold my trades longer than 10 minutes uh, unless I happen to be in a circuit breaker hall and it's going really well. If I have a trade that's not working, I'm going to manage my risk by cutting the loss quickly. I'm going to accept average losses of not more than $500. My profit target might be $700 to $1,000, and I'll take $700 if the stock is showing weakness. So as part of your business plan, you outline and, and allocate um, how much you're willing to risk, what your profit targets are, um, what type of um, strategies you're going to have to mitigate risk in terms of... Uh, you know, just because you say you're only going to risk 500 doesn't mean you couldn't put yourself in a situation where you could risk, you know, 5,000. So how are you going to mitigate risk? And um, then uh, you, of course, also have um, taking into account taxes, which we'll talk about in a second, and evaluating both your operating costs to be a trader, which realistically for me, where I'm at, I, I subscribe to uh, some... I, it's a pretty nice charting software. It's like $170 a month. Uh, it's not required, but I really like it. Uh, I have my real-time level two data fees that I pay to NASDAQ. Um, most day traders will pay those. Uh, the, those are like $40 a month or something like that. So I'm at about $210 a month. And, um, and that's about it. Uh, I feel like there might be something else. but So let's just say $300 a month. So my operating cost is $300 a month. Uh, now, for every trade that I take, I may incur a commission depending on what broker I use. So feel free, those of you guys live streaming, to let me know which broker you're currently using. Um, let's see, and where are we at on, we've got about a thousand on YouTube, so thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you guys um, have given the video the thumbs up for our little Saturday uh, school class. If you haven't already, hit that thumbs up button, and uh, same with those of you guys on Facebook, and feel free to share this with a couple of your friends. So I'm seeing Thinkorswim, CMEG, Interactive Brokers, CMEG, TD, I think of Thinkorswim, Lightspeed, Nice, Schwab, Robinhood, Quest Trade from Canada, Charles Schwab, Weeble, IB. All right, so um, good, good. 
Nice. All right. Uh, e trade. Yep. Nice. Very good. Quest trade. CMEG. Interactive brokers. Okay. Cool. All right. So a lot of you guys are using uh, brokers that don't charge commissions, uh, which are which is great. However, there are brokers that do charge commission, and um, this would be I don't know what's a how to draw the connection on that to the um, coffee shop, but but. Uh, the free commission brokers, uh, they just so you know, they don't really cater to super active day traders like us. Um, not that they don't accept us as clients by any means, because of course they do. Uh, but what they really focus on are um, more like uh, what we would call kind of passive investors who, you know, might take a couple of trades um, a, a quarter, maybe a few trades a month. They're, they're just not super super active so uh traders like that they don't demand a lot of the platform you know they're happy if it works they don't really you know they, they, they just have a lower standard of um of of what's acceptable which ultimately makes it easier for you know the brokers to please them so uh, traders like myself um i use a broker called lightspeed which is um they're in Manhattan, and, and they really cater to retail traders like us, de uh, day traders like us. So it, it, it's, um, I don't know, maybe it's like a point of, maybe think of it as like a point of sale software. Probably um, there's a lot of different point of sale software that you could get, um, you know, to run credit cards and stuff like that. But finding a service that's free um, but then is slow and you're sitting in the coffee shop and there's people in line and you can only process a credit card like once every like minute and a half because it's like just a slow system. It's free, but then there's really a cost. So uh, nothing's truly probably free in that sense. Um, I don't know if that's really a good an analogy, but let's just, let's just say that it is for now. So, um, so yeah, so you've got your monthly operating costs, and then you've got your initial startup uh, capital, the, the amount of money that you need to fund an account. Now this is, um, you know, again, I can show you Jan uh, December 1st, 2019, uh, and I'm going to use the tag of CMEG because this was the broker that I used. And this uh, right here, these are actually the metrics from my small account challenge. Uh, I'll do net profit here. So. Um, this is $53,000, but if we look at the overview and we look at the calendar, uh, what you'll see is that um, on day one, I had $520 in the account. $520 on day one, and I made $139. So from a starting balance of $520, I turned that account into $53,000 in 17 days. So you might think, oh gosh, I don't want to use my startup capital to pay for uh, nice software or to pay for you know a, a good computer or to pay for high-speed internet or to pay for education like one of our um, workshops or the warrior pro class for instance you, you might think I'm just gonna save all that money to trade with but what I'll tell you is that uh, in a heartbeat without a strategy you can lose money in the market and for every small business out there there's probably, I don't know, five that have failed for one that succeeds. I mean, it's just, we know that small businesses are, are hard to start and day trading isn't any different. So you really want to equip yourself as much as possible um, and position yourself to be successful. And so I think from that perspective, startup capital is not, um, it, it's not the most important uh, piece of the equation for two reasons. Num number one, uh, because I've known traders with a lot of that started with a lot of money and then lost it because they didn't have a strategy, and and then I've seen traders with small amounts of money, including myself, that have been able to grow it because they've got a, a proven strategy. And number two, because you shouldn't trade with real money until you have first proven you can be profitable trading in a sim. Trade with pretend money, fake money, or if you use a broker like eTrade or Ameritrade. Trade with one share. You don't have any commissions. So just trade with one share and set your daily goal at, you know, 50 cents. You know, something like totally, it, it doesn't matter. It's a tiny amount of money. But if you can make 50 cents a day with one share, what's going to happen when you go up to 10 shares? You're going to make $5 a day. 
Okay, now what happens if you go up to 100 shares? Are you gonna make $50 a day? What happens if you go up to 1,000 shares? Would you make 500 a day? What happens if you go up to 10,000 shares? Right, so now there's obviously going to be you know some kind of diminishing returns as you scale a strategy, um, but I currently trade with anywhere from a low of 6,000 shares to a high of 20,000, sometimes a little bit more. And I could trade with more size than that, so, but I probably wouldn't go a lot higher than 30,000 shares. You never know, but I probably wouldn't. So anyways, that kind of um, uh, gives you uh, hopefully a little bit of perspective on uh, how to approach the business plan. You've got to think about, uh, obviously it begins with just discovering that this is a possible career and that it's one that you feel you have both the aptitude and the interest to take on. Opening a small business, whether it's a coffee shop or a um, you know day trading uh, business for yourself, is a um, you know it's got to be something that you feel a passion for. Now I feel like every day when I'm trading, I'm coming into the market to uh, try to solve a puzzle. It's and if I solve it, I make money. And so it's uh, very gratifying each day to see a market where it's a little every day's a little different, slightly different puzzle. But I have a system of how I'm going to try to solve it and, and, and pull profit out of the market. So, you know, it's the business plan starts with the discovery, then it's an outline of general strategy, what you're kind of modeling it after, a case study of someone who has done this and is profitable that you aspire to be similar to, uh, whether that's me or someone else, it's, you know, whatever relates to you. Then initial uh, uh, equipment and startup costs, computer, you know, a thousand bucks. Your education with warrior trading, um, you know the warrior starter class or the warrior pro classes. Um, your couple of monitors, your internet connection, you know a couple of subscriptions to market data, things like that. So you know you're into it with you know a couple thousand dollars on the low side, maybe four or five thousand on the high side, depending on. I mean, you could obviously get a ten thousand dollar computer if you want to, but you know it just within range. Uh, and then you've got, um, of course, in addition to the initial startup costs. For a coffee shop, you've got your initial startup costs, and then you've got your ongoing monthly expenses. Those, even right now, for me, are very minimal. Uh, for the month of May, uh, I just finished the best month of my trading career, uh, as many of you guys know, with uh, $225,000 in gross profit. Oops, uh, 5-1-2020. Five, 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 okay, here we go. And I'll just jump before like this. All right, so this is uh, the month of, of May. Oops, I gotta take my CMEG tag away. $225,000 gross profit. Best month of my career. And you know what my, my overhead was? Like 300 bucks. Now, I had commissions, and my commissions were $15,000 plus 7,000, which is 22,000, meaning my gross profit after commissions is about 205,000, which is still really good. And as I said, I'm, I'm willing to pay that commission because I don't think I would have been able to make as much as I made if I was using a broker like E-Trade or TD Ameritrade. Not that I couldn't make money there, but I don't think I'd be able to make as much because they don't provide me the tools that allow me to, to uh, trade the market in the way that I trade it, both with direct access routing, hotkeys, and uh, a really good low latency uh, trading platform. So. You know, this is a month of two hundred five thousand dollars in gross profit. All right. So now let's talk about the taxes. All right. So the taxes. This is kind of a, a tricky one because taxes are different for for everyone, depending on where you live, what state, what co what country, then what state. Are you single? Are you married? Are you filing jointly? Are you filing individually? So there's a lot of um, there's there's a, a, an infinite number of scenarios. So having said that, let's just say, for instance, um, your, your, your goal was $200 a day. How many of you guys right now would be totally happy with $200 a day? $200 a day, if you're doing that consistently, is $50,000 a year. All right, so you know, let's say $50,000 a year is, is your net profit. That's after commissions, but not including your monthly overhead, but since it's only $300 a month, you still have a gross profit. Uh, well, let's. I'll just. I'll give you guys a second. All right, you guys. You like the idea of fifty thousand? Okay, I like that idea too. It's two hundred a day. That was kind of my goal when I was getting started. Uh, two hundred a day. Um, 
Now, obviously, I'm averaging this year. Um, oops, let's see. So my, my average this year currently is um, $4,161 a day, and my gross profit is $428,000 on the year right now. So 200 a day is making 5% uh, of what I'm making. So I'm not, I'm tr in, in, the, in other words, I'm trying to set the bar low for you guys. Um, but at the same time, this is the blessing and the curse of the market. You won't start making 200 a day consistently until you have a strategy that works. Because when you don't have a consistent strategy, what will happen is you'll make $200 one day, you'll make 400 the next, and then you'll lose 800 bucks. And then you'll make 200, and then you'll make 400, and then you'll lose 900. And so you'll have two steps forward, five steps back, three steps forward, two steps back, eight steps forward, 12 steps back. And you will generally be losing money until you, you're able to minimize those losses. But you're not gonna be able to minimize that until you've either gone through 12, 18, 24 months of trial and error, which is what it took me, or you basically have the roadmap and a template for a strategy, like the one that I'm gonna give you guys who are part of my classes, and you practice it in a simulator and you prove that you understand it, and then you know, you're, you're consistently trading a strategy that's already proven. So it's, try to reinvent the wheel or you know, basically um, do what's already been done and, and proven it to be profitable. So anyways, um, 200 a day, $50,000 a year. All right, so that's your, that's your gross, that's your net profit. Now let's say during that year, you had $10,000 in commissions. So what that would mean is that you actually made 60,000, but your net profit is 50. You don't pay tax on uh, the gross profit. You pay tax on the amount uh, after commissions, which is good. All right, so that dropped you from 60,000 in gross profit to 50,000 in net profit. Now, uh, as a small business owner, just like a coffee shop, what are some of your business expenses? That $300 a month, all right. Take that, 300 a month, that's times uh, 12 months, you've got 3,600. So now you go from 50,000, you drop it down to um, 46,400. I think that's right. Okay, 46,400. Now you've got some equipment. You can't always write off equipment in one year. Some of it you have to depreciate over a period of years. But let's say you've got enough equipment that you can depreciate another $500. All right, so now you're down to about $46,000 in um, what, what could be considered taxable income. Now, in my opinion, if your cost of living is, let's say, $30,000 a year, or let's say $36,000 a year, that's $3,000 a month, then you've actually made $14,000 more than you needed. So wouldn't it have been smart if you had made that $14,000 in a retirement account. And so I trade in a retirement account. So almost all of this profit this year, not all of it, but maybe maybe 70% of it is in a retirement account, which means I have no income tax on it. Now, of course, that requires you an ability to set up multiple accounts. Uh, that takes time to grow multiple accounts. So it may not be something that happens on year one. But let's say it's something that definitely keep in mind for the future to take a little bit of that profit each year and put it aside into a retirement account where it can grow tax free. But let's say you didn't do that on your first year. So you've got $46,000 in profit. So now the question is, um, you know, what is your tax bracket? So obviously there's the standard deductions and things like that. Do you have dependents, or again, single, married, filing jointly, filed separately? So then you've got those different questions. So let's say you're able to get yourself down to um, you know, the 25% um, bracket, right? I mean, if, if you were able to get yourself down uh, to, the, to, to that bracket, that would be, um, I mean, I would say that would be, that would be preferable. It's not gonna happen, uh, ah, it's a mosquito. It's not gonna happen for everyone, and it depends on a, a number of different things. But if you could do that, what you could effectively do is um, bring your tax rate down substantially. Uh, potentially to the point where you're looking at owing anywhere from 5000 6000 to uh, ten or $11,000 of tax on the year. Again, you've got a range there, and I'm, I'm sure there's things you could do to, to get it lower, and there's other ways where it might be higher. Um, so 
you figure that you know for each each month you save um, anywhere from 12 to 18 percent or so oh my battery died hang on let me switch back to um, my monitor now that's interesting because um, the browser also stopped all right hang on one second um, I'm gonna switch this sometimes I have this problem with um, with OBS all right so video video and I'll just use my uh, computer camera here for now deactivate activate let's see whether or not that works let's see Hmm, that's funny that it just like shut off like that. Well, this is not going to be ideal to do it this way, but um, that's fine. Hang on, I'm just going to move these around for a second. Uh, there we go. All right, so I've got my. I'll just put this down over kind of in the corner so it's not um, blocking too much. So I've got my chat feed there. I've got um, this one right here. All right, and thank you guys. It looks like we've got about 1,200 streaming, which is great. Uh, if you guys have not already hit that thumbs up uh, button or subscribe to the channel, you um, should really do yourself a favor and do me the favor of doing that. So anyways, um, long story short on the taxes, you should obviously I'm not a CPA so I'm just sharing with you from my own experiences you should contact you should contact a CPA and you should get qualified advice uh, I can't give you legal advice I can't give you tax advice uh, but generally speaking you should save aside um, anywhere from 12 to 18 percent of your profits um, to cover the taxes because you will have taxes they are part of the deal I wish that we could uh, get around paying taxes but the only way to really do that would be to trade uh, exclusively in a retirement account, which you, do, you totally can do, uh, but then uh, you can't spend that money uh, until you're at retirement age. So that's not going to help you cover your cost of living. And ultimately, uh, I know you guys, most, most of you are wanting to trade to cover cost of living and then extra profit you'd consider um, once you've already hit your cost of living goals, looking into, um, you know, doing something with, um, with long-term um, you know, uh, uh, retirement. So, and legal entities, LLCs, S corps. Um, in my experience, they haven't made uh, a huge difference from the the tax perspective. But again, you know, you could you sh you should speak with a CPA on that just to um, you know get clarification on what's best for you. So, that's kind of um, you know in in total the the business plan. And now one of the reasons that I do think it's really important for you to uh, approach trading as um, basically the same as running a small business is because of the fact that, um, let me see, I've got half screen. Sorry, I just want to, I want to see if I can get my camera back up here. Um, I'm going to kill that one. And I'm going to kill this one. One of them is the camera and it's using it up. So take this opportunity to show you guys my disclaimer, my video capture. With uh, OBS, if you're already using the uh, camera once, sometimes it won't let it come up again. So it's kind of annoying when it does that. That's full face, that's half, display, yep, yep, yep. Okay, so I'm gonna go and add this here. Video capture, okay. Ah, there we go. All right. So copy that. Put that over here on this side. And I'll. Oh, we're brow our browser stopped right, so I'll put it right down here as well. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. So, anyways, um, yeah. From the losses perspective, one of the things that um, I think is really important. Um, is 
as I said, a lot of traders get into this habit of um, taking the losses super, super personally. And so, you know, you have a couple bad trades and next thing you know, you're, um, you know, you're feeling terrible about yourself and you're getting really emotional and you start getting impulsive and reactive and all of that is what starts a downward spiral and it can funnel and it can it like really fast where you're just spiraling down. Now, if you can adopt the mindset of a profitable trader, then you'll do a lot better. And so one of the things that you guys probably um, know at this point is that when I'm trading, I'm actually not looking at my, uh, my, my p and I'm not looking at my total profit and loss. So I actually don't, now sometimes I'll check it, but I usually don't know exactly where I sit on a stock while I'm trading it. And that allows me to focus on trading the best quality setups, maximizing the opportunity on the stock as much as possible without getting the hang up of um, the implication of a potential loss. So from the coffee shop perspective, it's it's different with running a coffee shop because you don't have a big PL, you know, up on the top of the wall every single moment telling you, oh, I just incurred a cost of, of running the business. I just had to pay, you know, a, a utility bill. Oh, that goes down. Or, oh, I just had um, a loss, of, you know, a trading mistake, that, you know, something like that. Um, you don't have that direct uh, kind of line to, you know, the ups and downs, which is a good thing because you don't naturally get... Um, the even ability to get so emotional about it. But with trading, you do. And so you have to actively fight against that. And, uh, and, and that essentially means coming up with strategies of what you're going to do to get yourself in the mindset of a profitable trader. And so that can be, you know, looking at a trader like me and saying, well, okay, what is Ross doing that's allowing him to be comfortable taking, um, you know, as much risk as he sometimes takes? We're going to feed the fish, um, and this is going to give you guys a good little uh, example of greed. Now, I want to show this to you because um, the market, as uh, you well know, is a place where there's a lot of fear and a lot of greed. Those are the two big emotions that, um, you know, that drive the market. Uh, no, you should still have me. Let me just double check. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm still here. So let's see whether or not, let me see on my view how this looks. By the way, those of you guys who haven't already checked out the summer school program, um, I'm going to put this up here and let me just play this. My name's Dave and I'm from Portland, Oregon. I've spent my entire life, uh, you know, working day to day, 40 hours a week, and, and uh, you know, my life is passing me by, and my kids are getting older, and I have grandkids. So I started researching, and I came up with, with day trading. When I came to Warrior Trading, and I seen that platform, and I heard Ross talk about, you know, retirement, and what's your long-term goal, and being that he was just a salt-of-the-earth guy, I had researched for about a month, and I've been to other sites and things I knew at that point that the Warrior Trading was the place I wanted to be. My name is Kim King, and I go by Kim K in the large cap room. The Warrior Trading program and all the tools and the chat rooms has really helped me be able to focus in and get a good understanding and develop a solid strategy that's been really working for me. If you're considering Warrior Trading, what I would tell you is that it's fantastic. I've gone on other websites with other trainers and I don't think anything is as good as what Ross and Mike and the whole chat room and all the group does. So it's a great program. I would invest in it. You save money in the long run, time in the long run. And I did convince a friend to do it. She's going to start after the beginning of the year. My name's Doug. Um, I've been a Warrior Pro student for almost a year now and I trade the small caps. I've always wanted to, to do day trading and give it a shot. I've known a couple of people that have tried it. Saw a friend commenting on Ross's chat room and uh, I asked him about it. I'm like, hey, is this a legit place to be? And he said, yeah, the guy knows, knows his stuff. I highly recommend it and that's the first time I joined Warrior Trading. Ross's teaching style is great. It's very easy. I feel like I picked it up very quickly, uh, the patterns and um, the technical analysis of it all. Well, before I got started with Warrior Trading, I wish I'd have known about it a lot sooner. I could have been doing this five, ten years ago rather than just the past year.
All right, so yeah, I just wanted to show that to you. Um, so those of you guys that do want to enroll in the summer school program, uh, summer school does start on Monday, uh, but um, and many of you guys have already registered. But you can see uh, we've got the special discounts right now for summer school. Some of you guys watching this, um, a, you know, a year from now, this may not still be valid. Uh, our prices, we increase our prices uh, usually at least once a year. So, you know, you can you can see what we're currently offering. But for those right now that are hanging out with me, um, I do encourage you to check out the summer school program. So I wanted to show you uh, the pond, which uh, I promised I would show you in my video uh, what was it yesterday? Um, so now of course my big camera has died, but you can see the pond here. So I was talking about how uh, Of course these fish uh, if I throw you know a couple little pieces of food in there It takes and this so that right there is a momentum stock. I just let's just pretend that I just threw a momentum stock out there right now some, you've got stock out there right now, right there with great news. Nobody cares. Nobody seems to really be interested in it. But what you find in the market is that when one person, well, not it's probably not one person, but when you know people start to notice, then all of a sudden, here comes the crowd and everyone wants to get a piece of the action. So these guys are still, they're not quite noticing it yet. Oh, see if they pick up on that. Okay, looks like Goldie's coming in, and there's Cindy. Cindy's our uh, white fish. Yeah, you can see her over there. Her, is that Cindy short for Cinderella? Romeo's over there with the little heart on his head, and RJ is coming. Oh, I see RJ coming over. There's Abe. He's okay. RJ is the first one to get some food, and here comes Goldie. Here comes another Goldie, and now it's on. All right, now the momentum's hot. Okay, I'm throwing, I'm throwing the, food, the food in, and you know what? Here's a little piece of mulch. I'm gonna toss this in, and you know what? They're gonna go for it anyways because they're in such a feeding frenzy that they don't know. They just, they'll jump at anything. And this is what we call a hot market. When the market's hot, and it is right now, we're seeing COVID-19 headlines. So stocks are coming out left and right with breaking news, and they're squeezing up 100, 200, 300% and traders, we're all hungry, we're looking for opportunities, and so we're jumping on everything that moves. And then there'll come a time when all of a sudden things start to slow back down, for whatever reason. It just starts to kind of taper off. The feeding frenzy ends. Fear starts to sink in. A couple of those fish bit down on a piece of mulch. Ooh, that didn't work out so well. Maybe I'm gonna be a little bit more cautious. Traders have a couple of losses. We start to step back. We get a little more careful. And uh, that can be the beginning of a slow period. A little bit of a, you know, the ebb and flow in the market, the pullback. And then before you know it, another feeding frenzy will start. It's not realistic to expect that you'll make the same amount of money every single day, you know, 250 trading days out of the year. You'll have some days where you crush it. Uh, where it's a feeding frenzy and those are the days where you have to be aggressive you want to try to capture as much as you possibly can uh, and then you know make sure you get enough to tide yourself over for when things slow down and that's a, that's an aspect of this business as a day trader it's also probably an aspect of running a business um, let's say as a, a ice cream shop you run an ice cream shop in New England You've got one season where you've got to make the most that you possibly can before things slow down, right? Summer. Because when things slow down, you know, it's going to be a long winter. So uh, with trading, it's not seasonal, but it's cyclical. And part of your trading plan should allocate when the market is really hot, what do I do to maximize on the opportunity? For me, I increase my share size and I start trading more. So I took more trades in the last month than I've taken in, I think, any other month. And that was the right thing to do. When the market goes through a slow period where things kind of ease off and we're not seeing that, um, that sort of exuberance and those really, um, those big moves, then that will be a time where I will trade less. I will ease off the throttle. I'll slow down and I won't be as aggressive. And, and that's, that's part of uh, the mindset of a trader. And that can be really hard to accept at first because you'll sometimes feel like, 
I want to be making money the same amount every single day. You know, this month um, making $225,000, yeah, that would be pretty amazing to do that um, 12 months in a row. But I think that that's an extremely unrealistic expectation. You shouldn't expect that your best month can be replicated 12 months in a row. You will have great months and then you will have slower months. As a beginner trader, one of the things that can be really hard is when you have your first uh, slow months. Because when, when you have those first slow months, it can, uh, you can sometimes question whether or not your strategy even works. But that wouldn't be the case with an ice cream shop in January in New England that's on the beach they're not going to be surprised the business is slow. Why not? Well, because through common sense, uh, they understand how it works. But there isn't really a collective common sense when it comes to day trading, because this is niche and it's not something enough people do that you can really learn um, a lot of common sense just through like through life, the way you can with other uh, careers. So. I hope this has been helpful for you, uh, talking a little bit about how to uh, approach trading as a business. And for those of you guys that do want to uh, take the leap and, and start your own business as a trader, we'll be starting summer school on Monday. So I would love for you guys to register. I did host a, um, a class about a week and a half ago, which was um, essentially the first class of summer school. and. Uh, so those of you guys that want to watch a replay of that class, you're welcome to watch the replay. And during the class, I talk about uh, the summer school curriculum, and I give you guys an opportunity uh, to register uh, with that uh, special summer discount. So if you want to watch that, uh, you're welcome to do that. It'll be um, uh, happening. Let's see, that class is going to happen tomorrow at 1 o'clock. And then uh, summer school starts on Monday. All right, so um, check out class so I'll post that for you guys on YouTube. Again, those of you guys on YouTube and Facebook, um, throw out one last thumbs up. Looks like how many people do we have streaming right now on YouTube? A little over a thousand. Thank you guys for being here on a Saturday and uh, tune in uh, tomorrow. I'll probably jump on live again and I'll see you guys. Uh, I'll try to charge this battery up a little bit longer so I can keep the big camera running, but it's good to have a backup. All right, have a great day, everyone. I'll see you guys um, right back at it uh, tomorrow when I jump on and then Monday morning. All right, so I'm going to put this back up here, my disclaimer, and I'll see you guys for the next episode. Bye, everyone.